Uh, hello students, this is a recording for Biology 1406, um, Chapter 8 in the OpenStax textbook, um, Photosynthesis. This is the um, third lecture um, of Unit 3, the third and final lecture of Unit 3. All right. Um, so uh, photosynthesis, of course, is one of the defining features of autotrophic organisms, and hopefully y'all are all um, well-versed on the difference between autotrophs and heterotrophs, all right? Um, so autotrophic organisms um, produce their own organic molecules from inorganic precursors. Um, at its very simplest, that's going to be uh, water and carbon dioxide. Uh, the carbon dioxide is reduced by taking electrons and hydrogens uh, uh, atoms off of water and adding them to a carbon dioxide molecule to make a COH molecule. Um, all right, um, so uh, making of a sugar or other organic molecules from inorganic precursors is the defining um, feature of an autotrophic organism. Um, Further subdividing that topic, there are um, two general um, ways in which autotrophic organisms function. Um, one, and perhaps the older system, is chemoautotrophs that use a um, energy source in the form of um, usually an energy-rich inorganic compound, something that can be um, oxidized, and that is the power source for making organic molecules from uh, water, carbon, and other uh, uh, mineral elements. So that's chemi uh, chemoautotrophy, and we see organisms like that. They're inevitably bacteria living uh, associated with um, volcanic uh, vents uh, under the um, uh, at the bottom of the ocean. Middle Mid Atlantic Rift would be a great example of that. Um, <clears throat> hot springs, geysers, and places like that where there's a lot of thermal energy available. Photoautotrophs are the other great big uh, camp of autotrophic organism, and by far the most abundant. And uh, all plants, uh, algae, and cyanobacteria are, are photoautotrophs, and they use uh, the energy um, present, the um, the uh, uh, kinetic energy present in uh, photons as a power source um, for generating their organic molecules from inorganic precursors. All right, so a little bit about autotrophs and heterotrophs. <laughs> So another important idea of photoautotrophy um, that hopefully is uh, not uh, alien to you is that all food chains, which is an ecological concept, uh, what eats what eats what eats what, um, food chains and food webs are based on um, autotrophic organisms. So the base of the food chain always must be an autotrophic organism, either a chemoautotrophic or a photoautotrophic. Uh, down at the bottom of the ocean, there's quite a few chemoautotrophic uh, food chains, or at least um, um, partial food chains that are based on that chemoautotrophic bacteria. Um, those inevitably, uh, those food chains inevitably intersect with food chains that uh, derive their energy from the sun via photosynthesis, but um, the idea still holds. So at its simplest, photosynthesis is using the power of sunlight to, um, or using sunlight as a power source to push the um, combination of carbon dioxide and uh, part of water, uh, the hydrogens of water, um, to form carbohydrates. And then oxygen is released as a uh, waste product, um, not uh, necessary in the photosynthetic pathway. It's a byproduct. <laughs> Um, this was an interesting experiment uh, done, um, ooh, I should have the reference, but I don't have it ready. Uh, but uh, famously, plants were grown uh, by experimenters um, in the uh, 1700s even, um, trying to uh, determine what material it was that the um, plants consumed to grow. And of course, the reigning theory at that time was, and very seemed very logical, was that uh, Plants formed themselves from material they drew out of the soil. Uh, very, very reasonable. <clears throat> well, experiments were done growing plants in a very carefully measured amount of soil um, for a number of years, and then um, pulling those plants out of that soil, 
tediously and carefully collecting all of the soil and weighing the plant dry and the soil dry afterwards and comparing. And what they found that was only a tiny, tiny fraction of the dry soil weight was uh, consumed during the course of the plant's uh, growth, and yet the plant um, represented many, 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 many thousands or even millions of times the uh, missing mass in the soil. So act clearly, the mass of the plants has to come from somewhere else. As it turns out, of course, the mass is primarily composed of um, cellulose uh, and water, uh, but as far as organic material, it's cellulose and then, of course, all the other organic uh, components of that plant, and those are composed primarily of water and CO2. Um, and of course, CO2 is drawn out of the air, or for aquatic organisms, it's dissolved in water and pulled in uh, <clears throat> through uh, solution. And water, of course, is uh, imported by the roots from the soil, but it's not a permanent component of the soil, not part of the dry weight of the soil. Um, in terrestrial plants, um, they have an epidermis that allows for gas exchange uh, through the uh, function of specialized pairs of cells guard called guard cells which uh, define an opening um, when they're in the closed state there's no gas exchange when they're in their open state there is gas exchange uh, that structure that opening is called a stoma uh, stomata plural uh, very similar to the pupil in your eye the pupil is actually an opening in the iris it's equivalent to this open space right here and it looks black because you're looking into a um, dark you know confined space that's transparent behind there all right <clears throat> We'll go ahead and look at this ana uh, animation real quickly right here. So I'm pausing or recording while I set it up. Notice the stoma start becoming apparent right here as we get closer and closer. There is one stomata, or one stoma of many stomata. Now we're looking at the spongy mesophyll of the leaf. Uh, that is the um, permeable interior space of a leaf, which is uh, air-filled, if you weren't aware of that. And we're looking at individual um, mesophyll cells, just plant cells of the you know, inner structure of the leaf. And we're going to dive down into one in just a moment here. And so punching through, we're seeing, you know, the various uh, subcellular structures inside, passing by a mitochondrion right there. And the green um, spherical structures or, you know, oblong structures are um, going to be the chloroplasts. So we'll take a closer look at chloroplast. <clears throat> this is where the green in plants comes from, from the uh, photopigments and chloroplasts. So these are the folded compartments. They're a continuous compartment called thylakoids. The stacks are called grana, but the entire thing is a thylakoid. Uh, these green pancake-shaped mounds and structures right here, these are all thylakoid folds uh, collectively referred to as grana. And that's the site of the photosynthetic activity. So we're looking at ATP synthase spinning along right here. Um, we're looking at the proteins of the electron transport chains and in blue, and the protein complexes that contain chlorophyll, the um, photosystems, photosystems one and two, um, at work right here. <laughs> Other things moving around appear to be uh, ATP and ADP molecules being regenerated. And so the, uh, you know, one of the great things about this animation, it just shows you that, you know, unlike in the book where we see A and ATP synthase, one copy of Photosystem 1 and 2 and whatever, um, there's millions, untold numbers of these things scattered around on the surfaces of uh, those thylakoid uh, membranes inside each chloroplast of the many, many chloroplasts inside each photosynthetic cell of the many photosynthetic cells inside a plant. Uh, the scale is everything. All right, so let's carry on. And thank you, California Academy of Sciences, where a good uh, uh, friend of mine from graduate school works. All right, um, you do need to know this um, general equation. 
um, for photosynthesis. And I've talked to you all about this in our our lecture section session on Thursday. If you run this um, reaction in the opposite direction, let me see if I can get my marker pen right here. No, it's not going to cooperate. Um, but if we turn this arrow around and, and face this in the other direction right here, we would be looking at the oxidation of sugar in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water in a pile of ATP instead of sunlight. Uh, so the cellular respiration grand uh, reaction diagram runs is this in reverse. But this is photosynthesis, and so the power source for the uphill climb of putting carbon dioxide and water together to make sugar with oxygen as a byproduct requires a power source, and that power source is sunlight. <laughs> so the photosynthetic process involves two major regions. We divide it up into two large portions that we study, um, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, also sometimes referred to as the dark reactions. Not that they have to take uh, place in the dark, but they, are, they themselves are light independent. Um, so here's a basic schematic um, relating those two processes to each other. Um, so within a um, chloroplast, and that's what we're looking at right here, the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and then the membranes of the thylakoids, which is where you'll find all of the um, uh, molecular equipment for uh, the light reactions bound. <coughs> On those surfaces right there, we're going to use light energy to strip electrons off of water and protons, so uh, hydrogen atoms plus electrons off of water, leaving only water as a byproduct right there. And then those electrons and uh, the protons um, that went with them are bound to a transport uh, molecule called NADPH. Um, and at the same time, sunlight powers the regeneration of ATP using a structure very similar to what we've learned about already in cellular respiration, the electron transport chain and ATP synthase. Same idea and very similar uh, mechanisms and molecular structures doing roughly the same job um, on the thylakoid membrane surfaces um, powered by sunlight regenerating ATP. And then what happens is the uh, ATP is used as a power source to pay for the transfer of hydrogen and electrons to carbon dioxide to make a carbohydrate, uh, GA3P in this particular case. Um, that is a three carbon uh, sugar right there that is produced. Um, again, we take CO2, we bind it to an intermediary in the uh, Calvin cycle, very similar to the steps in the uh, citric acid cycle. We add hydrogens and, pro and electrons to that carbon dioxide using ATP to power the process and generate sugar molecules. And we do this continuously, recursively. And those um, oxidized NADPHs, which are now NADP, they've been oxidized, they've had electrons pulled off of them. And the uh, discharged adenosine diphosphates plus organic phosphate are regenerated in the light reactions and available to continue powering this process. So you do need to know the terminology uh, of the bits and pieces of the um, of the uh, chloroplast right here. So do you recall there is a double membrane out here. So that's a phospholipid bilayer. This is another phospholipid bilayer. And then the thylakoid is a phospholipid bilayer that's folded up really, really in a terrifically convoluted sense so that these are all really technically extensions of one compartment, just super folded. All right. Um, the uh, fluid filling this area, uh, which would be the cytoplasm of the cell, is the equivalent of the cytoplasm, just has its own special name in this particular setting. It's referred to as stroma. Um, but for the record, it really is just another version of the idea of cytoplasm. A little bit about light energy. Um, We've talked about this in laboratory, so you're familiar, but we'll review very, very quickly. Um, you do need to be able to talk about light energy and electromagnetic radiation a little bit. So um, this diagram down here represents the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's very small right here, but hopefully you'll recognize um, the visible light spectrum is this small section in the middle right here, which has been amplified in this drawing right here, going from 
the uh, short wavelength blue or even uh, violet and ultraviolet end of the spectrum all the way to the long wavelength red end of the spectrum right here. That's the visible spectrum. It becomes invisible off this way to our eyes and invisible off this way. Uh, not because there's no light or energy there. We just don't have photo detectors that are sensitive to those wavelengths at these ends right here. We have no means of capturing that information. The electromagnetic spectrum um, runs from the uh, X-ray uh, and uh, gamma ray and X-ray and UV um, wavelengths through visible light down into infrared, far infrared, and radio waves for the longer waves right here. So that's the entire electromagnetic spectrum. All of these are waves that propagate through space at the speed of light. And they um, have a kinetic component to it. Um, they are waves of energy, but they also have a particulate nature. And the particulate nature, the uh, particles, the photons, can impart kinetic energy on a surface they strike, which is why things heat up when they're hit by light. And that's the basis of the pho photosynthetic uh, process, um, is using the kinetic energy of uh, light to uh, excite an atom all the way to the point where we can break an electron free of it, which is called... Um, um, uh, <laughs> ionizing that atom and that kind of radiation therefore is referred to as ionizing radiation all right um red light has very long wavelengths and that means less peaks going by per second the equivalent of you know uh, more time between impacts of the peak of uh, energy right here short wavelength uh, radiation has very very short wavelengths and since the waves are um, moving at the uh, same speed in all cases right here, that means more peaks per second or per microsecond or hour or day or whatever you want to measure, more peaks striking per unit of time right here, transferring more energy. Therefore, blue light and gamma radiation way up here, but blue light in the visible spectrum is more energetic than red light or infrared radiation or radio uh, radiation. They have less energy that they transfer. <coughs> So visible light runs from the 700 to the 400 nanometer uh, uh, um, range of wavelengths right here. And this diagram is reversed from what we almost always see in the books. It doesn't matter, it's still correct. Uh, they've just turned it around. So here's the high energy end of the spectrum. Here's the low energy end of the spectrum. Um, and you should commit these numbers to uh, memory. 400 is about the maximum um, um, frequency, the shortest wavelength. Uh, light that can be seen by most things and, you know, used. And 700 nanometers is the red end of the spectrum right here. There's a number of organisms that can see further down into the inter infrared spectrum right here. Pit vipers, for instance, can see way down here in the, uh, in the uh, heat range. Uh, a lot of insects can see up here in the UV range of um, uh, the spectrum right here. Uh, mammals and vertebrates, this is about the maximum breadth of their visible um, range of light that they can see. And importantly, this is the range of light energy that's used by plants. <clears throat> so the key for plants to use light energy is to have well, what's called a pigment. And uh, these are called pigments because they have color. Um, you know, so it comes out of the art world, world really. Um, but these are molecules that absorb certain portions of the um, light spectrum. And so because they absorb certain, certain portions of the light spectrum, um, those colors that they don't absorb, the portions that they don't absorb, define the color that we see. So chlorophyll famously appears green because it absorbs blue and red light and uh, transmits green and yellow light relatively easily. So we see those colors left over um, after the other wavelengths have been absorbed by uh, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll A and B, these two uh, molecules right here, differ in uh, functional groups. There's slight differences in the structure of the molecules right here, and that has a big impact on the particular bits of the visible light spectrum that they absorb. Uh, chlorophyll A is the solid line right here, absorbs a little higher up in the blue range of the spectrum, but not as effectively, and then absorbs quite a lot of red light as well. Chlorophyll B, on the other hand, does a much better job of absorbing blue and short green wavelengths of light, and not nearly as much red light. And then finally, the yellow dotted line right here, or the dotted line, represents beta carotene, a pigment that appears completely red, orangish red, because it absorbs blue and green light, but does not absorb any red light. Here's beta carotene. 
And those are the three most common photo pigments that we see in plants. There's quite a few others that are responsible for other colors. <clears throat> Examples being uh, lycopene and zeaxanthin, <laughs> there I said it, um, which give us the red colors and yellow colors um, indicated right here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this animation. The process of photosynthesis produces ATP from ADP and PI by using the energy from light to excite electrons that are passed along an electron transport chain. Coupled with the transfer of electrons is the pumping of hydrogen ions and the splitting of water molecules. The following complexes are found in the photosynthesis electron transport chain. Photosystem 2, cytochrome B6F, Photosystem 1, ferrodoxin NADP reductase, and the complex that makes ATP, ATP synthase. In addition to the complexes, three mobile carriers are also involved, plastoquinone QB, plastocyanin, and ferrodoxin. Other key components include photons, chlorophyll molecules, protons, water, molecular oxygen, NADP and the electrons to form NADPH, and ADP and PS, <coughs> which combine to form ATP. <coughs> This is, occurs in the chloroplasts of plants and algae. The process is also found in single-cell organisms, such as cyanobacteria, that do not have chloroplasts. Like its mitochondrial counterpart, the chloroplast electron transport chain consists of several protein complexes and mobile electron carriers. First, a photon of light hits a chlorophyll molecule surrounding the photosystem II complex. This creates resonance energy that is transferred through neighboring chlorophyll molecules. When this energy reaches the reaction center embedded in photosystem II, an electron is released. The reaction center chlorophyll contains electrons that can be transferred when excited. One photon is needed to excite each of the electrons in this chlorophyll. Once excited, two electrons are transferred to plastoquinone QB, the first mobile carrier. In addition to the two electrons, QB also picks up two protons from the stroma. The two electrons lost from photosystem II are replaced by the splitting of water molecules. Water splitting also releases hydrogen ions into the lumen. This contributes to a hydrogen ion gradient similar to the one created by mitochondrial electron transport. After two water molecules have been split, one molecule of molecular oxygen is created. Plastoquinone QB then transfers the two electrons to the cytochrome B6F complex. The two protons it picked up are released into the lumen. These transfers are coupled with the pumping of two more hydrogen ions into the lumen space by cytochrome B6F. The electrons are next transferred to plastocyanin, another mobile carrier. Next, the electrons are transferred from plastocyanin to the photosystem I complex. It is here that photons again energize each electron and propel their transfer to ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin then transfers the electrons to the ferrodoxin NADP reductase, also known as FNR. After two electrons are transferred to FNR, NADPH is made by adding the two electrons and a hydrogen ion to NADP. The gradient created by the electron transport chain is utilized by ATP synthase to create ATP from ADP and PI. This is similar to the way ATP is synthesized in the mitochondria.
ATP, NADPH, and molecular oxygen are the final vital products of photosynthesis. All right, um, so that animation and that film uh, summarized, well, actually it gave in great detail the steps in the um, light reactions, that first half of photosynthesis. So let's review it very quickly. The key components right here um, are a um, pile of proteins all uh, mounted in the membrane right here, which contain photopigments, uh, particularly and importantly chlorophyll. Uh, there may be other pigments in here as well, which would give this a different color, but this one's indicating it's just chlorophyll A and B, I see them. Um, and that is a photosystem. So this is photosystem, PS, photosystem, photosystem 2, um, named that way because it was discovered second. <coughs> we have an electron transport chain that includes proton pumps. Very similar to cellular respiration um, electron transport chain. Different specifics, same idea, same function. Photosystem 2, which accepts those electrons, called, oh, sorry, photosystem 1, which accepts those electrons, is called photosystem 1 because it was the first one that was identified and characterized, um, re-energizes those electrons using light energy a second time, and uh, transfers those electrons to a, an electron acceptor, uh, NADP uh, reductase right here, which reduces NADP to NADPH. Um, that's the fate of the electron right there. And this process carries on continuously, powered by light, stripping electrons and protons off of water, producing uh, molecular oxygen as a byproduct, and supplying us, or, and that is a source of protons and electrons ultimately to reduce carbon dioxide and that's going to be they'll be carried and transferred via NADPH and it's reduced form here carrying the electrons and protons. The proton gradient that was generated by uh, this first electron transport chain between photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 that ATP that proton gradient is used to power ATP synthase which generates a continuous output of re reformed uh, ATP from inorganic phosphate and adenosine diphosphate, just like in cellular respiration. Same idea, same, same you know, basic uh, mechanism. Um, one notable difference is the polarity of this. Uh, protons are pumped out of the mitochondrion and go back down the concentration gradient. In the case of cellular respiratory uh, photosynthesis, the protons are pumped into the lumen of the uh, thylakoid uh, stacks, the uh, granul stacks, um, into that inner lumen right here, and then they diffuse out into the stroma, the cytoplasm of the chloroplast, um, and as they diffuse out through the ATP synthase complex. Um, here's just a closer look at that same thing. So photosystem two, electron transport chain, which includes proton pumps, photosystem one, uh, which uh, transfers electrons to an um, uh, electron acceptor, which in turn transfer, and this is a short electron transport chain really, but it transfers electrons to NADP, reducing it to the NADPH state. Both of those photosystems, again, are powered by light energy. ATP synthase right here um, is powered by the proton gradient generated by electrons falling down this first um, electron transport chain. So photosystem two is where water is split. Electrons that ultimately end up in sugars and protons that end up in sugars come from water and this is the source of those. Um, photosystem two takes electrons from the electron transport chain and reboosts them again to a high energy state. And then those electrons are gonna be captured and saved in the form of NADPH. Very much like our cellular respiration chapter, I need you to know the uh, term for this complex right here, photosystem two, where water is split and electrons originate. This electron transport chain, you don't have to memorize the name of the individual proteins here, but the chain includes two proton pumps. Photosystem one, where we reboost electrons to a high energy state using light again. 
and then the electron transport chain that terminates in NADP reductase, which is simply an enzyme that reduces NADP to NADPH. So this structure and these reactions right here, the light reactions, feed the Calvin cycle by producing a continuous stream of ATP and um, reducing NADP to NADPH. And those are the two inputs along with CO2 into the Calvin cycle to generate a um, three carbon sugar. All right. Uh, so, uh, reviewing the uh, steps of the Calvin cycle right here, um, first a couple of terms. Fixation refers to the binding of CO2 to um, the uh, ribulose phosphate molecule right here. This is this five carbon uh, molecule right here. So we attach a CO2 to it, temporarily making a six carbon molecule, which is immediately split. Again, you don't need to know the names of these intermediates <laughs> along the way right here, um, but you do need to know a couple of uh, you know uh, terms and names. Um, a key one, and is highlighted right here, is Rubisco. This is this extremely um, abundant protein, the most abundant protein um, by most people's calculations uh, that do this sort of thing on Earth. Um, and it is the um, enzyme that catalyzes the binding of CO2 um, to uh, ribulose biphosphate, hence Rubisco, because um, that's it's named after the uh, substrate it acts on. Um, and then we introduce um, for one one cycle of this reaction, so to produce one half of a glucose, that's a three uh, GP molecule right here. It's half of a full glucose molecule. Um, we need six ATP, six NADHs, another three ATP, so a total of nine ATP six NADPHs and one, um, sorry, and three molecules of CO2. That's the balanced reaction to get one um, three carbon sugar out of this process. So to make a three carbon sugar requires three CO2s, there's our three carbons, requires um, uh, actually 12 uh, um, electrons in the form of the six NADHs and is going to require the energetic content of nine ATP molecules, six over here and three more over here to power that reaction. So to get an entire molecule of glucose will require six CO2, uh, 18 ATP, and 12 NADPH. So there's your balanced reactions. Three cycles are required to make one of these uh, um, three GP um, um, half sugar molecules. So here we are in just a little bit more detail again. To make one three carbon sugar, we need three CO2s coming in, nine ATP in total, six NADPHs in total. To make an entire glucose, this they're saying here one half of the glucose molecule, but if we wanted to make an entire glucose molecule, we'd have to double all of this. So um, I mentioned this uh, in our uh, lecture session yesterday, um, Rubisco, this uh, enzyme, this incredibly abundant enzyme in uh, photosynthetic organisms, is the uh, key enzyme in binding CO2 to a carbon chain, and that process is called CO2 fixation. Um, it also, unfortunately, is very good at binding oxygen to that same um, um, five carbon intermediate in the Calvin cycle reactions. That process is called photorespiration, and it's a malfunction, if you will, of the uh, photosynthetic pathway, and it gives us a bit of an insight into um, the uh, age of the system. So the photosynthetic pathways evolved on Earth prior to there being an oxygen-rich environment. In fact, the oxygen released by photosynthesis is the reason why we have oxygen present in the atmosphere and dissolved in uh, seawater and freshwater, of course. Um, and the system, the enzymes, and the entire pathway evolved in the absence of atmospheric oxygen. But as that oxygen became 
um, ever higher and higher in concentration, um, we start seeing an increase in a malfunction called photorespiration. As a result, quite a lot of plants, including this cactus right here, and grasses, and um, any number of plants that we rely on or that are familiar with that grow in extremely hot and dry environments have mechanisms to reduce this particular problem right here by basically amplifying or protecting um, rubisco's exposure, um, amplifying its exposure to CO2 or reducing its exposure to oxygen um, so that the, the photorespiratory uh, pathway does not accidentally kick into gear. All right, uh, let's see. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at this last animation here, and then that'll be the end of this recording. Photosynthesis is the basis for all life. Thanks to photosynthesis, plants could grow and evolve, and it has served as the foundation for other living beings, such as the dinosaurs and the human species. Oh, that's pretty silly. Photosynthesis takes place in leaves of flowers, bushes, and trees. First, let's find out what a leaf looks like. On top, we can see a thin layer of wax called cuticula. It minimizes water loss and increases the stability and resistance of the epidermis. The main task of the epidermis is the protection of the leaf cells. Cuticula and epidermis can be found on both sides of the leaf. On top of the epidermis, in the bottom, is a spongy tissue. It allows the interchange of gases for photosynthesis. It's the spongy mesophyll. Furthermore, vascular bundles, which can often be seen with the naked eye, allow the transportation of water, minerals, and other products. The palisade cells can be found on top of these veins. Palisade cells contain many chloroplasts that can be seen here as green dots. Chloroplasts absorb a major portion of the light energy used for photosynthesis. So let's uh, notice the great big central vacuole in this plant cell right here. So here's the cytoplasm around the perimeter. Here's the cell membrane, and they haven't shown it, but a cell wall outside of that. Here's the membrane of the central vacuole full of um, a salty, sugary uh, liquid substance right here, and then the cytoplasm of the cell with a nucleus, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, and all of that, and most notably lots and lots of chloroplasts. Try and remember back to our um, osmosis lab, um, one of the last labs we did where we, um, as a side project, took a look at Elodia leaf um, tips uh, from an aquatic plant that we put under the microscope and challenged with uh, salt water and distilled water for photosynthesis. So let's have a look at one of them. Chloroplasts have a protective membrane. A liquid called stroma is found inside the chloroplast. Thylakoids are embedded in this liquid. Thylakoids consist of a thylakoid lumen surrounded by a membrane where photosynthesis takes place. Lumen is a term you'll see a lot um, in biology and in the sciences. It refers to the space enclosed by something. So the lumen of a cell is simply the space enclosed by the cell membrane. The lumen of the nucleus is the space enclosed by the cell, by the nuclear membrane, etc., etc. So lumen of the thylakoid. Lumen is kind of a, a, yeah, a standard word uh, that you want to know. The lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum is the space enclosed by the ER, etc., etc. If we take a close look at the thyloid membrane, we see the photosystem too. It is linked to the stroma and the lumen. PS2 consists of light harvesting complexes that surround a photosynthetic reaction center to focus energy. Light harvesting complexes consist of chlorophyll, such as chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B. These chlorophyllists absorb light, namely photons, and transfer the energy to the photosynthetic reaction center. This is the reason why plants are green, as light with a wavelength of about 500 to 600 isn't absorbed but reflected. This is called green gap. The energy of the photons cause the chlorophyll molecule to enter an excited state and electrons are ejected from the molecule. As a consequence, the molecule is charged positively 
to absorb other photons, the molecule must return to its initial state. Therefore, it is in need of electrons. To get them, the PS2 uses water. Here, electrons are ejected from H atoms and the H atoms are separated from the O atom. This happens several times and, as a result, two O atoms combine to form an oxygen molecule that will be emitted later by the leaf. Simultaneously, the positively charged hydrogen ions get into the lumen. The electrons are transported to the PS1 via an electron transfer chain. In the course of this electron transport, protons are being created that get into the lumen. This will result in a protein gradient between the lumen and the stroma, generating a force called proton motive force. Those protons don't get into the lumen, they're pumped into the lumen by uh, uh, transport proteins that are powered by electrons um, passing through them. Proton motive force drives ATP synthase that produces ATP from ADP and a phosphate group. This process is called oxidative phosphorylation. The electrons that this pro so that's pretty good right there. So yellow represents the protons that are driving the process. Green and blue here represent ADP plus phosphate and uh, orange, uh, as it's about to be labeled here, um, ATP, the finished product. Process is called oxidative phosphorylation. The electrons that are transported from PS2 to PS1 are used to balance the loss of electrons in PS1 because PS1 absorbs light and this results in the oxidation of PS1 and the release of electrons. Electrons coming from PS1 are transported through an electron transport chain to their final electron adapter, NAPD, creating NADPH. ATP so remember, it's easy to distinguish between NADH and NADPH. NADH is the reduced electron carrier one of two, along with FADH, in cellular respiration. NADPH is the one electron carrier that we talked about in photosynthesis. The way to remember that is that there's a P here for photosynthesis. That's not what it's here for. It's for phosphate, but you can use that as a memory tool, NADPH photosynthesis, NADH, cellular respiration, NADP, photosynthesis, NAD, cellular respiration. All right. And NADPH, which are products of this process, can then be found in the stroma, where a process known as Calvin cycle takes place. No light is necessary for the Calvin cycle. During the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide is reduced to form carbohydrate in a series of reactions. Here, NADPH is the reducing power source, whereas ATP is the energy source. Glucose is the primary product. It serves as an energy source for the plant itself. In the forms of polymers, such as starch, it is also an energy source for animals and human beings. By producing oxygen and capturing energy from inorganic compounds to produce organic compounds, plants are considered to be a very important part of nature and life. Alrighty, well that's the end of this recorded lecture on photosynthesis. Um, be sure to check out the recorded lecture on cellular respiration that precedes it and um, refer back to your notes from our live lecture on uh, metabolism before the um, spring break.